Thanks for inviting me today so I can tell you our story about um, reestablishing the state boundary. Um, North Carolina Genetic Survey, we're tasked to establish and maintain the official survey base of the state of North Carolina. And one part of that is the state boundaries and county boundaries. And I want to introduce my staff here, Dennis Lee and Ronald Harden, they're both professional land surveyors, and they run our county and state boundary program. And then we have Jeff Stickley, he's here as a student intern, he's doing research for us on uh, satellite positioning. So have a great staff. So if you ever have questions about county and state boundaries, uh, you can give Dennis or Ronald a call and they'll be glad to help you out. I use the keyword reestablished because by statute and by the state constitution, when we started our work to, um, to reestablish the state boundary, that's what we could do. We cannot change it. We can only follow in the footsteps of the original surveyors. Uh, and so our task was to go back, find all the historical information we could find, and put that boundary back on the ground where it was located. Also, let me get to my slide here. Um, a lot of newspaper articles have been written about our work. And a lot of times you'll see the word uh, boundary dispute, border wars. Um, from the very beginning, uh, North Carolina and South Carolina have worked jointly together on this. There's never been a dispute about um, where the boundary is. The dis and confusion has been, over the years, the two states did not maintain our boundaries. So the evidence has disappeared. And so the counties that worked, that were along the borders, did the best they could with the best available data they had to try to interpret where the boundary was. Unfortunately, counties in South Carolina and North Carolina, their interpretations didn't agree. And so uh, as the land developed along this boundary, it became uh, a problem for the landowners, for the counties, to interpret where the boundary was. So probably in the 90s, our office would get calls about from surveyors, and I'm, developing, I'm working to develop this property, and I need to know where the state boundary was. And all we could give them was the original surveys, um, some that go back to 1735. And so at that point, North Carolina, South Carolina uh, decided that uh, we need to reestablish the boundary. And so uh, our agency, the North Carolina Genetic Survey and the South Carolina Genetic Survey, signed an agreement, and then uh, Governor Hunt at the time created the Boundary Commission, and then over the years, uh, Governor Perdue, Governor Easley, Governor McCroy have all extended that, and we've worked together very uh, jointly with South Carolina to reestablish the boundary. So um, let me get in and tell you a little about the story. This is a poster we created for educational purposes that kind of tells a little history about the state boundary. But this was the when the two Carolinas was to be divided, this was the instruction that the king gave uh, to divide the two states. To shall begin at the sea, 30 miles from the west, the side of the mouth of the Cape Fear River. From thence it was to run northwest course to the 35th degree of parallel, and then west of the Great Seas. So uh, the first survey started, they followed the instructions, went 30 miles, they started at the coast, and they went northwest. Uh, unfortunately, which kind of, you hear this, the rest of the story, unfortunately they didn't go all the way to the 35th degree of parallel. We don't know why. Uh, it could have been um, their observations. They made an error in their observations. It could have been they ran out of supplies. Uh, we don't know why, but they stopped short of the 35th parallel. And that set into place the rest of our, our state boundary by that one point being not at 35th degree of parallel. Um, it was in Scotland County. They, set a, they said they set a stake there. Um, and you look through history, there was numerous and you look on the map and it indicates they think they were at 35th degree of parallel, um, but that they weren't. And so the next survey, and this is where they did the 1735, get our PowerPoint to go here, to that point. And if you'll notice here, these are all the different colors. This section uh, it was resurveyed, the blue section was resurveyed in 1928, and then the kind of the light green there was resurveyed in 1905. So that section there, uh, Dillon County, uh, when we had to reestablish it, all we had to work with was that original 1735 to 1737 survey. So this is the, the map that we is located here in the archives. We used as part of our research. We hired um, North Carolina, South Carolina, hired two firms to help us do the research and do the survey work. One a, was a South Carolina firm, one was a North Carolina firm. And their job was to go in, again, to reestablish. So we had to go back to that original survey look for land records during that time period that made mention of the state boundary, take those land records today and bring them to today and relocate where that corner is today was on the state boundary. So they did an outstanding job 
of reestablishing the boundary. And here's some, you can see the original map was a lot of detailed, uh, mostly trees that they marked. Obviously a tree that was marked in the late 17, mid 1700s was no longer there. So those historical land records was very critical for us to have evidence to replace the boundary in its original location. And more details here. So see, uh, very nice map, a lot of, lot of details for that time period. Um, but still uh, made it very difficult to retrace. So after the 1735-1737 survey, uh, the next survey, there was actually some surveys done uh, before the official survey in 1764. Uh, some local residents did some surveys to extend that survey. But in 1764 was the next team of surveyors and their job was, assuming they were on the 35th degree of parallel, that they would extend it westward to the Great Seas. But you can see they started and then they ran into the Catawba Nation property. And at that point they realized that they were too far south. And so that set into motion um, the next survey in 1772 to go around the boundaries of the Catawba Nation and then compensate South Carolina for some of the property they lost uh, in the original work. So uh, the 1764 survey started at this point and ended it at, there at the old Salisbury Road. And I'll show you in a minute, there's a, a stone that was set there, and we call it the North Corner. And it's still there. It's been hit by a car, but it's still... Uh, <laughs> and the lo local residents have put a fence around it, uh, which I don't think will stop a car, but maybe it'll protect it from vandalism. Uh, so at that point there, so you can see, um, and it's funny, we had a public, we had quite a few public meetings and um, to advise the residents of what we were doing. So the first one we had was in South Carolina. And Dennis and I drove up and the parking lot was full of cars. Think, oh my goodness, this is not gonna be fun. Uh, and it, a lot of the cars were for something else, but there was still a lot of people in our room. Come to find out, they thought we were gonna put the survey back where it was originally supposed to be, where the dashed line was. They thought we were gonna put it back at the 35th degree of parallel. So once they found out that that wasn't true, about four people stayed then, so. Uh, <laughs> so that was really good, really good. So, um, so you can see the green is the 1772 survey, and so that was done to compensate. You can all notice that the 1772 survey, once it got up um, to the point where it went due west, it was supposed to go due west, but you can notice it went kind of tracked towards the north. And we think that was, there's a lot of iron ore in that area, so that could have been the reason they were using the compass, and the compass may have been drawn by the iron ore, and it deflected it uh, a little bit to the north than, it, than they were instructed to do. These are uh, from the 1737. These are the maps we found here in the archives. Uh, you can see this is the point here um, that uh, was supposed to be at 35 degrees. And you'll notice they noted that. And then that's the point where they started from the 1764 survey. So the 1772 survey started at the end of the 1764 point um, at what we call the north corner. It went up, north, up the Salisbury Road, which at the time was a distinctive road. And from that point, it went around the Catawba Nation, down to the Catawba River, up the river to the forks of the Catawba River, and then west. And you may have seen some articles at the point where it went, um, at the Catawba River where it split off and went west, they set a stone, there was a stone there. And as part of our reestablish, we tried to find that stone. Well, the stone's uh, in Lake Wiley, it's underwater. So, um, so we went back and we found surveys that were done by the Southern Power Company before the lake was flooded. And in one of their surveys, they noted they, they found the stone and they tied that stone into their property corners. And we were able to find those property corners today. So we knew mathematically where it was at. So uh, South Carolina and North Carolina had divers that went down to try to find the stone. Um, there was a lot of silt there, so we've never, never found the stone. But mathematically, we were able to compute where that stone was at. But, on the Southern um, Power Company survey, um, they described the stone very, it was a very distinct stone. So we think either uh, it's still down there under the silt or somebody realized that that was gonna get flooded and they took that stone home because it was very pretty. So, uh, so it may be there and it may be not, but mathematically we can replace where it's at. So the 1772 survey went up the Salisbury Road around the Catawba Nation and then to a point um, in Polk County, 
that uh, terminated there um, at the end of the 1772 survey. This is the map um, that was given to, was provided to each state of the 1772 survey. Uh, you can see the Catawba Nation here. Uh, you can see up the Salisbury Road here to a point. Um, then it went um, due west, or went supposed to go west uh, to a point there in Polk County. Um, all trees, they marked all trees. So that was our challenge, uh, to reestablish that boundary and all the evidence was marked trees. So what we had to do, what we, our contractors uh, went back and looked for land records during that time period. Um, anywhere from t that time period to 30, 40 years after that, because uh, we assumed that what they marked that was still visible for that time period. So we were looking for land records, for grants, for title transfers that call for those, um, those line trees. And here's some examples of some parcels that we found. You can see this one over here on the right. It called for the 19 mile tree. And it has a very unique shape. So all we had to do was take that land grant for that time period and bring it to today and try to fit it in where the property is today. This one on the left there you can see is a 22 mile tree. So we looked for that all along this, this section of the boundary. This is probably uh, the most urbanized part of the state boundary. Uh, and we realized it was very important that we make the best effort we can, find all the evidence we can to reestablish that boundary because we knew it would probably impact the landowners in that area. So here's the one I just showed you. You can see the one here on the right. There's the actual document. See the northeast corner calls for the, uh, for the 19 mile tree. And so there's today's land records. And so what we had to do was take that grant and determine where it fits to today. And you can see that we were able to do that and determine that that northeast corner was a, a property corner of a parcel today. We went out and surveyed that pro property corner and now we have the location of the 19 mile tree. So we had to do that all through this, this 1772 section uh, to determine where the reestablished boundary was. This one's a unique one. Notice the shape. Now the north is this way on this map, this direction. But notice the unique shape of this grant here, uh, at the corner down here. And then when you go to today's land records, look here at this parcel right here. So there's that track, uh, which called for a, a line tree. And so we're able to there fit in that. And so that gave us more evidence of where the state boundary was when the original surveyors came through. So we, able, we did this all through that section uh, to reestablish those boundaries. And then if we couldn't find anything during that time period, we would keep looking farther up during the time period. We also asked uh, Penny, we, we had found the there was a stone set uh, when they started, when the 1772 survey, the next section was 1815, uh, they set a stone at the end of the 1772 survey called the Blockhouse Stone. And then mathematically, we knew where the stone was uh, in the lake. So we had the two endpoints. So the question is, is the state boundary a straight line in between those, or does it fall where the trees were at? And the Attorney General's opinion was, our job was to follow the original surveyor where those trees were, even though it might make slight deviations. So we had to go back and find all the evidence that we could. And we successfully did that. Uh, and very confident in where we have reestablished the state boundary along this 1772 section. And a little later on, I'll show you some of the uh, issues that have developed because of our reestablished the boundary, how it's impacting some landowners and what we're doing to minimize that impact. So this, so that was 1772. So the next still had just got to Polk County. So before they finished the last section, it was determined that the section that was along the Salisbury Road that followed the Salisbury Road, um, for some reason, the Salisbury Road was not being used a lot. They were concerned about um, it, it being able to be visible. So they made a decision to go from, just make a straight line from the beginning of the Salisbury Road to the corner of the Catawba Nation. So this survey in 1813 did that. It straightened out that section. And this is what we call the north corner here. This is the one I was telling you about. It's been hit by a car. You can see they build a little fence around it. And there's a historical sign there at that point. Uh, so that stone is there. And that was the 1813 six section, which is this section right here. 
And then the last section was the 1815. And prior to the 1815 survey, North Carolina, South Carolina uh, assigned commissioners, kind of like the boundary commission we have today, uh, to formalize and agree on this last section. So they went down to the uh, Catalucci, Satuga River and marked a stone, we call it Commissioner's Rock. They did that in 1813. And this is the stone here on the Satuga River, latitude 35 degrees, AD 1813, North Carolina, South Carolina. And then 1815, the surveyors came in and surveyed that section of the boundary. Uh, that stone is still there. Uh, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. It's on the Chattooga River. Uh, has, been, has been preserved over the years. So this section here, it started at the end of the 1772 survey, uh, went to a point up on the ridge and then followed the ridge line to a point where the 1797 Cherokee boundary was and then from that point straight down the Chattooga River. And that concluded the survey of the division of North and South Carolina. So this is the stone at the end of the 1772 survey called the Blockhouse. Uh, you can see it was set in 1815. And that stone is still there. And this is Commissioner's Rock. Uh, you can't see it in the writing here, but see it is pointing to the Commissioner's Rock. Now, there's another story behind this in that Prior to this, North Carolina and Georgia were um, not in agreement where the state boundary was. And there was a lot of history about uh, what was called Walton County and actually Walton, what's called Walton's War. Well, they hired a, a very prominent surveyor man named of Andrew Ellicott, who surveyed Washington, D.C., to come down and determine where the 35th degree of parallel was. Um, and he was hired by Georgia. They brought him to the area actually took him about 20 miles up in North Carolina. He did his observations and realized I'm too far north and worked his way south. And on December the 26th, uh, 1811, he set a stone at 35th degree of parallel. Um, we do not have any of his field notes because um, Mr. Ellicott in the state of Georgia did not agree on his compensation. Um, he didn't think he'd get paid enough. So we have letters that he wrote, but we don't have his actual field notes. Um, everyone the concerns that that is Ellicott's Rock. And it's supposed to be an N and a G for North Carolina and Georgia. But in some of his letters, he described the stone he set as a planted stone uh, with Georgia on one side and North Carolina on the other. So we don't think that's really the stone he set there because that's not a planted stone there. So those a group of volunteer surveyors have been going up visiting the site trying to take information we have in his letters to try to find uh, what we think is the actual Andrew Ellicott stone. But uh, so far, we haven't been able to find that. But that's the Georgia boundary. That's a different story. Uh, the North Carolina, South Carolina boundary is, is the Commissioner's Rock. So that, that stone um, is what marks our boundary on the Chattooga River. So when we started that survey, we knew that there was two maps, two original maps done, uh, provided to North Carolina and South Carolina uh, after the conclusion of the survey. We, can't, we have not found our original here in North Carolina. And we know that South Carolina lost their original in the Civil War, and we know they came to North Carolina and made a copy of ours. So uh, we were not able to find their copy in South Carolina, not at the beginning. So after uh, a lot of research, uh, staff from South Carolina Geodetic Survey, um, Alan Zupan, went to the archives in South Carolina and described the map. And they found it had not been cataloged. And this is a tracing of the 1815 survey map that we have here. Uh, you can see it totals about 19 feet long. And that's what we used to retrace um, that section of the boundary. We actually started in that part of the state because that was kind of one of the driving forces. North Carolina and South Carolina was buying property uh, from Duke Power to create a park. And we needed to know where the state boundary was. And so that's why we started in the, in the western part of the state to overcome that and then move our way westward. Um, this end of the map, we've got it turned upside down so you can read the lettering. Uh, this is the west end here at the Chattooga River. It went a straight line up to a point uh, where the Cherokee boundary was in 1797 and then follow the ridge line uh, over into Polk County. That section of the boundary has been resurveyed and has gone through all the legal processes in both states. So we have reestablished that part of the boundary 
and has been completed and no, no additional work needs to be done. But most of this was, this map is just trees along the ridge line, but they did set a few stones and you couldn't take, um, they did a great job, but you couldn't take the whole map and make it fit today's maps. But what you could do is you could take little sections where they call for a gap or a road and make it fit today's maps. And so where there was stone set, that's what we did. We took the map, uh, we digitized it and got coordinates and went out to look for those stones. And this stone here, um, they call for a stone on the south side of, the, of a ridge and one on the north side of the ridge. Um, we took that digitized information and navigated within about 30 feet of these stones. So they did a, the work they did was great. And this is, I actually found this stone, so I get credit for this one. Um, we pulled up the root mat and you could start seeing the etching. And as you pulled it back, you could see more. You could see AD 1815, South Carolina. So once we cleared it off, there was etched in the stone, South Carolina AD 1815. Kind of like, you felt kind of like Indiana Jones, you know, you, <laughs> if, if, because the root mat was probably three inches. So there's no telling how long um, that had been covered up. Plus the other interesting point was on their map, they talked about their camp and their camp was about 300 feet from this stone. So we knew another location of where they camped during their survey. And then the map said on the north side of the, the line was a stone etched with North Carolina. And there was a North Carolina stone. And what, the only thing we could figure out is that South Carolina must have been paying more because they got more, <laughs> more wording than we did. We only got North Carolina. Either that or they got tired and they said, we're not going to do it anymore. So, um, so that gave us great confidence in this map because um, we were able to take it and retrace it. Plus, it's a natural ridge line. And then farther down, there was a planted stone uh, along an old road, and we found that. So we found a couple of stones, um, and then we were able to, to monument this whole ridge line, which was a, a great accomplishment. So that was the original surveys uh, we did. The blue part, uh, the 1815 here, that has gone through the complete process. Now, one of the unique things about a state boundary, most of the time you think they go to the General Assembly. Well, North Carolina General Statute 141 describes a process. So in our case in North Carolina, um, once the Boundary Commission has completed the survey, the Boundary Commission takes it to the governor. The governor then presents it to the Council of State. And if the Council of State approves it, the governor issues a proclamation and it becomes the reestablished boundary. So in our case, that's the process we've used on the 1815 section. In South Carolina, their process is they go through the General Assembly. So they have a little different process. But in both either cases, the 1815 section has been reestablished. Uh, the maps are recorded. And no additional work needs to be done on that section. So the 1905 section was done Richmond and Scotland County. Um, and this is the map. We have not found the original of this map. Uh, we found uh, a copy, a blue line copy, uh, in the Scotland County Register of Deeds uh, informed us of this. We have found letters from the surveyor for North Carolina was uh, Mr. Purcell. And we found letters where Mr. Purcell um, informed the governor that the work had been completed and that he was presenting his report and his map. But we still we haven't found the map. Uh, but we do have the original. And you can see that he set stones there. One thing he would have helped us a lot more is he gave us a distance from the end point to the turn point up there, and, but he didn't give us distances in between the individual stones. So it made it a little more difficult to uh, find those stones. This is uh, some of the stones. You can see the governor's names are etched in them. Um, and then at the intermediate points, the stones look like this here. A lot of these were, were down below ground level. Um, our uh, contractors, our professional land survey contractors, they were able to go back and find surveys done in the last 20 years where surveyors had tied into these stones. And that helped us find uh, quite a few of these stones here. Uh, South Carolina, one of the reasons someone asked, why did we resurvey that section in 1905 of Richmond, Scotland County? Um, according to the research done by South Carolina is because of, of um, distilleries. Uh, built along that location. Uh, either we were opposed to them or they wanted the tax revenue from it. So it's important to know uh, where the location of the state boundary was. We also were told that some of the distilleries after the line was relocated or reestablished, 
Uh, they actually moved their distilleries to very close to the line so they could provide services to both states. So, um, <laughs> so they, the errors are the ones that we have recovered. Um, they were very good in alignment, so we're very confident um, in our reestablishment of that section of the state boundary. And then the last section that was resurveyed was in 1928. Um, and that resurvey was needed because of um, the uncertainty of the boundary near the coast because um, there were some fishermen that were arrested, supposedly in South Carolina. They were North Carolina fishermen. And so the two states said we need to determine where the boundary is so that as people are doing fishing, fishing they will know which state they're in, which license they should have. So, uh, and this is the map on record here in the archives, the 1928 survey. And that was to reestablish that section of the 1735-1737 uh, bounty that was done. They set very nice granite monuments. I'll show you some pictures of them. So they started at the coast uh, here at Bird Island, extended their way into um, inland uh, up to 28 miles. Uh, this is the point out on Bird Island, uh, the end point. And these are monuments one and two. So you can see very distinct monuments um, that we found uh, still intact. And these are monuments set at the mile markers. Now I want you to pay attention to where mile marker six is located. See it's on a golf course, uh, looks like it's near a T. That's where we found it at. Uh, this is where it should have been, where it originally was at. Uh, when we went out to start serving it, we realized it was out of alignment. There was something wrong. And so we got to talking with the golf course and finally it was determined that um, it had been relocated because it would be great to have a state boundary marker at the T where you could hit from North Carolina into South Carolina. <laughs> so uh, actually a mile marker two and six had been relocated that way. Um, and so Dennis took that 1928 survey, uh, mathematically computed where it should be, used today's positioning technology, and look what he found. The actual hole where they pulled it out of the ground. And not only to prove that was the right hole, part of the monument was still in that they'd broken off. <laughs> so, um, so we, which tells you they did a very good job in 1928 uh, of surveying so we could take it today and relocate it. So with the help of the uh, golf course, they helped us move it. And um, they actually made it, you can see it um, very nice. They had gold letters that made it look very pretty, but it's back in its original location now uh, where, it, where it's been moved from. And these are some more, this was one that had uh, uh, fell over in the, in the river here. And so Dennis and I in South Carolina said, we'll, we'll pick this thing up and put it back in its original location. Was well, eight inch square granite. And how much did it weigh, Dennis? 800 pounds. So um, we went down there to move it and realized we got to have something else. So we, we came up with a way of getting it up on a card and moving it. So we successfully moved it, but it was not an easy task. Um, so that one's been put back, you know, back on the line. But these are these are some of the these are the the maps from the 19 uh, 1735-1737 survey that call for the point called the Little Boundary House. And so they set a monument there uh, to replace that point uh, on the original survey. And this is the one, when they did the 1928 survey, they found uh, a pine tree. And that pine tree uh, appeared to be old enough to have been there when they did the 1735-1737 survey. And the landowner allowed them to cut the, the tree down. And so they went in the tree counted the rings and actually found where the mark three had been marked in the original survey. So you could do the errors. And so uh, North Carolina and South Carolina both have a section of the tree uh, over in History Museum. Uh, and so in 28 they set a monument there um, standing alive where that tree was from the original survey. And this is the end point of the 1928 survey. You can see it's still intact. So this section of the, of the boundary was compared to the ones where we all we had to do was look for trees uh, was not as big a challenge. We just had to find the stones from the 1928 survey. So um, that's the kind of the history of what we went through. So starting in 1994, the two states agreed to reestablish the state boundary. 
instead of trying to do it all in one section, we did, um, we decided we work on it uh, in sections instead of trying to do the whole thing. So you can see the section, what was called Commissioner's Rock, uh, from A to C, that has been completed. Both states have agreed uh, on our work. From point C down to J, all the survey work has been completed. Um, but the Joint Boundary Commission gave us instructions that they agree that we've reestablished the boundary. But because some landowners are being impacted by the reestablished boundary, that we are to work to establish legislation to minimize that impact. Um, 23 landowners, homeowners, uh, by the reestablished boundary will have jurisdictional impact. In other words, they are paying taxes in South Carolina, but they're actually in North Carolina. And there's 53 houses that are, uh, the boundary goes through their home at some location. So does anybody know what the law is about if a political boundary goes through your home, which, which residence you're in? Where you sleep deals only with the election law. Uh, <laughs> so, so that's one of the things that we're working. Our goal is to, we're working with South Carolina to develop legislation to uh, protect these individuals from past taxes. So that someone can say, you know, you, you were in South Carolina these years, you owe us taxes. Um, residence requirements, does it mirror what the election law is? Uh, allow their children to, to continue to finish school. So we're developing legislation to, um, to try to minimize that impact. We, our goal is to introduce that legislation in 2015, and then if that's successful, then we'll start the process of getting the rest of the boundary uh, approved by both states. And then we can move on to the Virginia boundary. <laughs> so this is the statute I was telling you about, uh, General Statute 141. Um, it sets out the process of um, reestablishing the boundary. Um, there's also uh, 141.4, for some reason the two states can't come to an agreement in uh, what the process is. But as I said in my begin, North Carolina and South Carolina have jointly worked together. There's been no dispute. Uh, we've worked very um, well together. Our goal is to reestablish the boundary so that the next generation, for the next 200 years, there will be no uncertainty where the boundary is. Uh, it can forever be known where that state boundary is and we'll have to go through this process again. This is some of the impacts, uh, and this is, shows you the reason why uh, we need to reestablish the boundary. The yellow line is the reestablished boundary. That point 3B there was um, reestablished from a survey in 1805, I believe. So we have good historical information. The blue line is where York County denoted where the state boundary was. So you can see it started on the right, or left over there, kind of went around and and then the goal line is where Gaston County denoted where the state boundary is. So you can see the two overlapped. Wasn't a straight line through there. The, the building located marked as number 10 is a convenience store. Um, that convenience store is paying South Carolina taxes. Um, it's selling gas at South Carolina tax rates. Um, it's selling uh, fireworks. Um, it's selling beer and wine, and Gaston County is, is a dry county. So this landowner is going to be impacted uh, very severely. So we're working to, to determine ways that we can minimize that impact because the convenience store is actually in North Carolina. Uh, here's some examples of some homes. You can see home number two, the blue, is the York County. You can see the two, count, two counties, there's a uh, gap in between where they were denoted where the state boundary was. And so home home number two there is paying taxes in South Carolina, but the home is actually located in North Carolina. So this will be one of the homeowners that is impacted by a jurisdictional change. Same thing for number three and number four. Uh, you can see the boundary goes through the home there. So, um, so both North Carolina and South Carolina, we're working very hard to do everything we can um, to help minimize the impact to these landowners so that we can finalize the state boundary. Um, it, it, cause it can be not knowing where the state boundary is can have economic impact, um, could affect emergency response. So it's very important um, that we uh, define it so that the public, so that professionals, professional surveyors, the counties can easily determine where the state boundary is. And the, the, the biggest question we had was, is south of the border still south of the border? <laughs> 
and I'm here today to tell you it's still south of the border. <laughs> Except for one little on and on a restaurant is a little, about uh, 30 feet of it is in North Carolina, but the rest of the south of the border is south of the border. So. <laughs> And that uh, concludes, it has been a, you know, some people say, I love what I do. And this job was, you know, it was just a great job to have uh, been part of, had great staff, South Carolina has been great to work with. Um, and it is finding all the historical information that we found. So, well, I thank you all for your time. I hope you didn't take too long.